Welcome to Gotta Rock. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is the legendary Cy Adler. I met Cy in 1999 when my wife and I responded to an advertisement in the local paper. It was an introduction to a walk on the west side shore. And to my surprise, we thoroughly enjoyed our two hours or three hours with Cy Adler and discovered there was more to Cy than meets the eye. So I'm thrilled to introduce Cy to the show. Please welcome Cy Adler. Well, thank you for inviting me. Cy, let's get started as I do with all my shows. Share with us a little bit about your background. For example, where were you born and something about your educational background? Well, okay. I was born on a kitchen table <laughs> in Brooklyn. There were no hospitals at that time? No, there were. As a matter of fact, my older brother and sister were born in hospitals. I don't really know why I was born on a kitchen table, but I know definitely I was because there was a woman there named Mrs. Rubin from upstairs, and she came down, I don't, I, I don't know, see the event, and she picked me up, and I peed on her. And every time she saw me afterwards, she would say, oh, Cy, you're... You, I'm the first woman you ever peed on, you know, <laughs> which very embarrassed me when I was a teenager. So that's how I remember that I was born on a kitchen table. Well, what about schooling in those oh, days? Oh, you know, well, I went to school. I went to public school, and I went to Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, and I went to Brooklyn College, which then was free. Oh, Amazing. Part, part of CUNY. Yeah, it's part of City University. Did you ever major in those days? I originally started ma engineering. And then I switched to math, and, and then I switched again. My whole life switching from one thing to another, to oceanography. So, But anyway, uh, I got drafted out of the school and went to the Army for a year and a half. Learned how to kill people and did a lot of marching, which was probably good for me. Well, did you go to see any action somewhere? Or? No. No. <laughs> Just, I saw New Jersey, I saw Missouri, I saw... Okay. Ca Oakland, California. So you were pretty young at that time? Oh, yeah. I was 18, 19. And then I, I went back to school. I went to Berkeley for a term. In, in California? Yeah. Okay. And I finally graduated and, <laughs> and decided I wanted to see the world. So I joined, I had no money, so I joined the Norwegian Merchant Marine. I wanted to get an American Merchant Marine, but they weren't taking anybody. But I was able to get into the Norwegian Merchant Marine. They, did, they didn't pay. They paid about one-third of what the American Merchant Marine paid. And then I... Interesting, interesting year or so. What was the most memorable thing that you remember from that year, year and a half? Interesting. Well, we picked up cargo in the United... in the Gulf states. I went to New Orleans but mm -hmm. in Houston by boat. Mm -hmm. So we could spend a few days there. That was it. And then we went through the Panama Canal, which I thought was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we went across the Pacific Ocean, which is very big. You know, you know, 29, we were, as I recall, we were on sea for 29 days. And I, I worked in the engine room. I worked as a, what was called a wiper. Incidentally, I wrote something about this called Crazy to Go to Sea. I wrote a memoir. Uh -huh. And I'd love to find, uh, I'd be interested to show it to you, but I'd be interested also to find a publisher or to, maybe, maybe I'll put it online. Anyway, uh, so basically, in fact, I signed on with another guy, a Canadian, who was about my age, mm -hmm. who also had itchy feet <laughs> itchy and wanted feet. to That's see the world. Interesting term. It was an interesting term. I mean, you can't really do that anymore, the way we did it. Because ships don't stop. You know, they don't spend time dropping stuff away, cargo off. It's all because of the container revolution. Mm -hmm. Extremely important. In 1950, instead of doing, picking up cargo by piece by piece, they started putting things in containers. And now almost everything in the world travels by containers, which is much cheaper. And, and, and better in many ways. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it would be. Yeah. But when the ships come to port, 
they don't stay there that long. They stay maybe a day at the most. So my buddy and I uh, really got fed up with the, the food <laughs> and the pay on this Norwegian ship. So we, we sort of got lost on Mindanao, which is an island in the Philippines. Okay. As the ship took off for Jakarta. Yeah. You mean you were left behind? Yeah. On purpose? Well, you might say oh, that. Okay. And so we got lost. So we went back and they said, oh, we'll take care of you. Instead, they put us in a detention camp. Oh, the uh, Philippine Authority? Yeah, the Philippine Authority. So you were an illegal... Oh, an undocumented worker, so to well, speak. Well, basically, yeah. We weren't there as... Uh, <laughs> and so I was there for a month or so. And then I got on an American ship and went to the Japan, and Okinawa in Japan, which was, I thought, fascinating. And then we started back. And uh, unfortunately, one of the guys who worked with me was a little crazy. And he, he started a fight when we were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And he bit me. And the bite got infected. Oh. And I thought I would die. Oh, my goodness. But obviously I didn't. <laughs> because you're here to tell the story. <laughs> but I made an impression. Oh, you want to see the score? No, I don't. <laughs> anyway, that, 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 that was my sort of sea adventure. Okay. It's, but how did the oceanography thing come, come about? Because you said you were in, into, into oceanography, you were teaching. Oh, well, when, when I got out, then I went back to school. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I went, and then I was teaching physics at City. And, and NYU had a, an oceanography course. O, NYU also had an enormous, a big campus. Well, where were they at that time? Uh, NYU had a campus down at, around Washington Square, which they still have. Yep. But they also had an uptown campus where they taught engineering and science, and, uh, and they had an oceanography and meteorology, mm -hmm. where on the, on the Harlem River, it's, it's called University Heights, and it's now the campus of the Bronx Community College. Anyway, I, I, I took all the courses there. I, that's, that's how I became an oceanographer. Okay. Uh, phys, and, and then I taught oceanography. Oh, for about four years, wow. I taught it. And, and at that time, there was a lot of interest in oceanography, a lot of money, federal money going into oceanography through the Office of Naval Research, because, well, mainly because they were trying to figure out where the Russian submarines were. <laughs> no, I mean that. I believe you. Yeah. Did you invent anything or patent anything yes. during that time? One of the things, one of the, in what I wrote a, a thesis on at NYU was what's a device called a shallow water isobaric buoy. Interest in all over the world now is in with, it, with devices somewhat similar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That instead of sending people down, you send devices down which move along and stay in particular level because the, by changing the density of the device, mm -hmm. you can make it move up or down. Mm -hmm. That's basically what, what my shallow water isobaric buoy did. Once you invent something or develop something, anybody can use it. Mm -hmm. It must be in use today. Well, maybe some of the ideas were in use. I went up to Woods Hole, I spent some yeah, time yeah. here, and then there were several companies in the Woods Hole area who developed devices using some of the same ideas, some of the same principles. But you're probably best known for walking. Right. We heard about the great saunter. Right. What's a start of uh, the great saunter? Very, very quickly. So <clears throat> basically, I like to walk. So I started walking. I was walking with AMC. The, and, and then I said, well, I'll lead some hikes for AMC. What's AMC? Oh, the Appalachian Mountain Club. Okay. They're the biggest club around, the okay. walking club. The walking club, okay. Yeah. And they've been around a long time. Okay. Good, good, good group. So I was interested in walking along the shore, which was in a state of confusion because of the container revolution. In other words, everything was the industrial area in New York, the industrial port area, was being clobbered and dis and changed completely. Mm -hmm. You know, New York City 
used to be the major port. Manhattan used to be the major port in the United States. Mm. Not anymore. I... <laughs> well, what happened was the container revolution. Okay. Just, what did you discover about walking the, the rim of Manhattan? Then I decided, well, I mean, instead of working with AMC, maybe I can do it, make it a little faster and better. And I, I, so I put some ads in the Village Voice and some other papers and said, if anybody want to walk? And they did. So, so that was 1982. Maybe I'd walk once a month or something like that. And then in 1984, I wrote an article, which the Times published, about, mm -hmm. for Hudsonophiles, a long, long trail. And basically, I said, why don't we build a hiking trail along the Hudson? Basically, we got Hudson River is 315 miles long. And it got some attention. We incorporated after that. And uh, I asked a lot of questions. So one of the questions I asked, can, can you walk around Manhattan? Can you walk the shore of Manhattan? What does it look like? And we and said, oh, well, okay. As a matter of fact, we said, we're going to walk it on the longest day of the year. The longest walk on the longest day of the year. It that sounds hot. good. But it's very hot. Okay. So we said, ah, it's silly. <laughs> Too hot. <laughs> and so we, we converted it to the first Saturday in May. Okay. And, and the first time also, we went up the east side and then down the west side. And somebody said, you know, that's, the sun shines from the east. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it'd be cooler if you walked up the west side in the, and then came down on the east side. Oh, so every year you got better and better and smarter. Well, well, some people still say, let's go up the east side and come down the west because the west side is nicer. So we may change it again. Okay. But basically we do it. It's about 32 miles. It changes every year. First time we changed it, we had to go through some fences. I think or underneath. Really? Oh yeah. So how many people showed up last year? Uh, last year was the biggest turnout we ever had. We had about nine, oh, 950 people. Wow. It's grown. <laughs> Very affordable, and it's, anybody can do it. That's true. Maybe we're, what we're doing is right. And... Well, I did it in 19, where was it? Oh, I'm sorry, 2006. And I have the certificate okay. to prove it. And I think one of the right things to do is to give out certificates of accomplishments for people. For example, if you do a marathon, you get a medal at the end. When you do the Great Saunter, you get a certificate of accomplishment. Right. And when I did it in 2006, that day, even though it was the first Saturday in May, it was, that day was very, very hot. Oh. And it was in great shape. I already done several marathons. It turned out to be the most difficult athletic accomplishment of my career to date. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this goes right up next to my medals and next to my other certificates. I enjoyed it very much. And it is more difficult. As a matter of fact, I drop, I used to do, I've done quite a few saunters, but I remember when it was very hot, it was 94 degrees. One, one time. I, I noticed, of course, on the east side, we go through, we, we stop at a little toilet and I could see Yankee Stadium. And Yankee Stadium had the, <laughs> the time and the temperature. It was 94 degrees. So anyway, very hot. And I got, I got sick. I, I got very dizzy and sick. By the time I reached East 34th Street, I said, I can't do it. I'm going home. I'm going to take a cab. There were two, two people walking with me. One was a, a, a Japanese-American, and, and then the other was a, a, a guy, an uh, engineer. They said, oh, we'll go with you. We'll, you know. so, so they went home okay. with me, and, uh, and uh, I got home, and I, I took some salt tablets, <laughs> some beer, <laughs> and Good took a shower. So, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's interesting, these two people got married. They, they, they actually, they met on the saunter, and, and uh, I visited them a few times. Oh, excellent, great story. Yeah. So uh, they got to know each other doing that walk and doing the cab ride. In, in one of the articles in The Great Saunter is the Cherry Walk in, in the, on the Hudson. Uh-huh, yeah. And it has changed over time, 
describe the changes, and also I want to relate this to the Putnam Trail, as you know, in the Bronx, there's this lovely little trail called the Putnam Nature Trail. The Cherry Walk is part of the Great Sorter, and it goes from 90, from about 100th Street on the west side to 129th Street, it, along the Hudson River, between the road and highway. And it used to be just, you know, a, a rough walk. Not a rough, but a, a, a dirt walk. Right, a dirt walk. And road. they paved it recently. They paved it about five years, six years ago. So now it's bicycles can use it, and it's much more traveled. And there's three years ago, three or four years ago, I noticed there was a break in in the Cherry Walk Trail. In other words, the pavement had craved in, and it was sort of roped off, and it made it more difficult. I've been trying to get the Parks Department to fix that. <laughs> Three, three or four years. And later on, you, you mentioned that the, uh, that the Putnam Trail reminded you of the Cherry Walk. Right. The Putnam Trail is a beautiful trail, which goes to a park. And, and uh, I should leave it alone. <laughs> I think it's a... Uh, that, that was, uh, shore walkers, we, we try to walk where there's water, basically. But one of, one of the major walks that we do is over the old quote aqueduct mm -hmm. <laughs> water. Right. This was underneath, and we're not that far from the Hudson River. Okay. That's a beautiful walk. Mm -hmm. and, and the Putnam Trail, too, goes parallel to the Hudson. So you can see the Hudson at various points. And I think they should keep it. Keep it uh, natural. Mm. Okay. We're uh, hoping that the de Blasio administration will agree with you. I think so. Okay. Yeah. And we will, we put something in our newsletter to the effect that we would like to, we think the, the Putin Trail should stay. But we have, Shore Walkers has a newsletter. Mm -hmm. In fact, Shore Walkers has a, you can go to shorewalkers.org and you can get information right. about right. it. Right, your website and uh, website. so forth. Oh, and right. also, I think you have a song that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Pete Siegel. <laughs> right. How did that come about? Pete Seeger is a shore walker. He's a lifetime member, and he's walked on the Great Saunter several times. He's, he's, in fact, he's done the whole Great Saunter, but not at once, not in one year. Okay. And we gave him a certificate. And then he oh, okay. He broke. He was smart. He broke it up into two, two or three Four. years. More <laughs> years. A few times he came down with his guitar and played on as, as we walked along. One day he came up. He said, "I have a song, an idea for a song." about the Great Saunter, which was based on a melody of a lead belly. Lead belly, extraordinary uh, musician who came up from the South and, uh, and hundreds of different songs. And one of the songs he wrote was, You Don't Know My Mind. <laughs> and Pete said, I mean, let's change the words uh -huh. to, You Don't Know This Town. So check this out. We, we sang it together, Pete Seeger and I. I sang, which is, <laughs> and he played the guitar. You don't know, you don't know this town. Till you join the show walkers, and they get you walking around. It's about 32 miles around Manhattan's rim. It's about 32 miles about Manhattan's rim. But you can join them for a few miles, and next year, come again. We'll walk you down the east shore, and walk you up the west. Walk you down the east shore, and walk you up the west. Take you to Hell's Kitchen. See what you like best. I wrote some of these verses. Okay, excellent. You can take a yellow cab or a subway cheap and fleet. You can take a yellow cab or a subway cheap and fleet. But you learn a lot more walking on your own two feet. So put, your, put on your calendar the first Saturday in May. Right on your calendar the first Saturday in May. And drink a beer at the seaport at 
the end of a great day, which is what you did. Right, so you don't know. You don't know. You don't know this town. You don't know. You don't know this town. Till you join the shore waters and they get you walking around. You have a long history of accomplishments. What's left? You know, what do you see coming up? Oh, in well, the... one of the things is the Bat to Bear Trail. What we would like to do, the Bat to Bear Trail, very briefly for those people who don't know, mm. is from the Battery to Bear Mountain. That was your first book. It starts at the Battery, goes up the west side to the George Washington Bridge, the Little Red Lighthouse, then goes over the George Washington Bridge onto the Palisades. Well, you're up 500 feet. Goes into the Palisades and then down 400 steps. I like you to note exact numbers, or pretty, well, pretty exact. I, I did it with some students and I asked them to count them. So. <laughs> Make good use of their time. This is a copy of the, of the new book. This is the latest and second edition of the book. The, the publisher changed the title from Walking the Hudson Back to Bear to Walking Hudson from the Battery to Bear Mountain. He said, who knows what Bat to Bear means? Now, Pete Seeger loved it. <laughs> he loves the new title? Or the no, old, you, you love the old title. The original Bat title. Right. Well, I would go with Pete Siegel. <laughs> I would too, but it's available, and as a matter of fact, if people want a copy, let me know. I would like to make that a national trail. What does that mean, a national trail? A national trail is a trail that is designated a national trail by Congress, and uh, you get certain, there's about 30 or 40 of them in the country at this point. It, it, it should be a civic, it should be, it should be beautiful. And I, I think the, the Bat to Bear Trail is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes on the Palisades, it goes through parks, mm -hmm. along the Hudson, the Queen of Rivers. One of the first national trails, the Appalachian Trail. Okay. That's a national trail. Okay. It takes an act of Congress to do it. And basically you have to, First of all, talk to your congressman. In New York, it would be Gerald Nandler and Charles Rangel. Okay. But then it also goes to Bergen County, so you'd have to ask the congressman in Bergen County to do it, and then it goes to uh, Rockland County, so you'd have to ask the oh, Okay. It's a process, and another proposal, and that is to convert one of the six, no, two of the six lanes, Around Manhattan, there are six car lanes built by Robert, mainly built by Robert Moses, mm -hmm. but basically at the time everybody was building roads. And so, <clears throat> what I would like to do is convert two of the trails. Two of the lanes. Two of the lanes. Yes. To walking and biking. So. I've mentioned it to certain people and I've written something about it, but I haven't published it. I really should. Oh. And I'll, I'll mention this. Of the Sanchez. His name is Shorty Sanchez. Tell us about Shorty. No, Shorty Sanchez lived, was the oldest man alive. And I think he died last year. And he was 112. Wow. Well, I mean, 112. People have lived longer than that. But still wow. <laughs> yeah, still wow. I asked him, what do you do? For, well, what do you do? So he said he did three things. He ate a banana a day. He took aspirin every day, and he walked a lot. That was his secret to longevity. Well, they asked him, he said, I don't know. You know <laughs> <laughs> How do you answer a question like that? You know. The best you can. People say I'm healthy, and, and, and frankly, I look at some of my friends who are my age, and they're not in that well, how, how old are you, I say? Well, old, old enough. Old <laughs> enough to know better, huh? You know, it's a funny thing about age also. Different parts of the body age differently. For instance, my former wife, who's 10 years younger than me, she has Alzheimer's. Now. Oh, sorry to hear. Well, I'll tell you, I'm in good physical shape, and one of the reasons I think I'm in good physical shape is because I walk, and because I do exercises in bed every morning. Before you get up? Yes. Okay. Before I get out of bed, I get into the habit of doing sit-ups and push-ups and various other physical exercises with a few weights. Okay. I do it every day. Okay. And I think, frankly, doing something like that every day for, say, 
20 minutes or more, 20, 30 minutes in the morning is healthier than going to a gym, say, three, three times per week. Or okay. Three okay. Times. Well, that's your method. Getting, getting yeah. moving is, is a good mm -hmm. thing. Moving is a, is a good thing to oh, do. Oh, yeah. You get, you get, you get, get the, the blood, heart You get the blood moving. Well, is there uh, one last story you want to share with us? As I said, I was in oceanography. And I started a company called Offshore Sea Development Corporation. And, and, and there was, it was like a little boom, it's, you know, because people were interested in the ocean. They yep. said the ocean is the wave of the future, you know. It, and, and I was able to raise some money and start a company. And we made some patents. Wow, what a handsome, <laughs> a handsome dude. That's when I had more hair. Oh, look at I had that. More hair. My God, do you have uh, Earl Flynn looks? No wonder you were a seaman. You no, must have broken no, a few hearts out at sea. Anyway, yeah, this is one of the devices that our company developed. It's called a single point mooring. This was before the container revolution, and this is for loading or unloading large tankers without bringing them into a port. Okay. And it's, so it's a device we developed and almost sold, and then the market collapsed in 1970s. All right. And as a matter of fact, just as a sideline, I had 300,000 shares of that company, and at one point the stock went to four, so I was a millionaire on paper. 1.2 million. Yeah. And then it collapsed, and I, did, I got maybe 15 thousand dollars I think. Well listen on that note thank you so much for coming in. It's been My a pleasure. pleasure.